the assassination of White Eyes. Okay, so his actual name is Koke Thagetston. So Koke Thagetston, the assassination of. On November 10th, 1777, two years after the beginning of the so-called American Revolution, white infantrymen, white American infantrymen assassinated native red American Cornstalk at Fort Randolph. So Cornstalk is assassinated, the chief of the Shawnee, during a peace negotiation on November 5th, 1778. White Eyes, the man of the hour, a native red Lenape American chief who was the white American revolutionary uh, friend. He was our friend, our ally. He was assassinated by the white American militia. Seemingly for no fucking reason whatso fucking ever. In October, November 1786, Maluntha is assassinated. Now, Maluntha was the one who took over for Cornstalk. So, 1786, this would be three years after the end of the so-called American Revolutionary War, which ended 1783. Psycho Hugh McGarry assassinated Maluntha because Hugh McGarry's call for the invasion had cost many Kentuckians lives, including Israel Boone, which was Daniel Boone's son at the Battle of Blue Licks in 1782. This is after the 1781 Battle of Yorktown. So why are we fighting after the Battle of Yorktown? The Battle of Yorktown was supposed to be the last battle. This is 1782. 1786 is when Maluntha was assassinated. So why are we killing Shawnee chiefs well after the end of the American Revolution? Three years after the end of the American Revolutionary War. Maluntha, a.k.a. Malunthi became chief of the Shawnee after Cornstalk's assassination. He was a signer of the Treaty of Fort Finney, a.k.a. the Treaty at the Mouth of the Great Miami. Shit, when Maluntha was captured by Benjamin Logan, he was flying an American flag at his village. So again, another ally, another person who sided with the American colonist were, was assassinated. He was killed. He's flying American flag. He had signed the treaty at Fort Finney, and Maluntha showed Benjamin Logan the treaty that he had signed. But the Americans, at least particularly Hugh McGarry, didn't give a shit about the chief of the Shawnee, even though he was an ally of the United States, even though he supported America and Americans. Hugh McGarry didn't give a fuck. So Hugh McGarry took an axe and chopped Maluntha's head in two. Tecumseh actually mentions the assassination of Maluntha as an example of the broken promises by the United States. There's been so many assassinations of Native Americans, it's not even funny. And it's the assassination of chiefs. They're the leaders, like the presidents or prime ministers, the Native Americans' nation's leaders. So is it any surprise that a government founded on regicide would also go and assassinate the Democratic Socialist Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973 or overthrow Haiti's government two times in the modern era 1992 and 2004 and overthrow Honduras in 2009? Can there be any justice on stolen land? So I want to make a quick note about the dates of the American Revolution. Now, historians like to dispute this, but this is an important discussion. When did the American Revolution start? Why did it start? And then what, when did it end? So the dates of the American Revolution are in dispute, but we're going to go with the official record. And the official record is that the American Revolution began on April 19th, 1775. This was when the shot heard around the world had been shot. This was the battles of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. And then it ends at the signing of the Treaty of Paris on September 3rd, 1783. So April 19th, 1775 is the beginning. September 3rd, 1783, the signing of the Treaty of Paris is when it ends. So that's eight years, four months, and 14 days long. Eight years, four months, 18 days long. That's compared to the four years that we fought the Nazis in World War II. 
I think World War One was about four years too. And Civil War was four years fighting the Confederates. And then compare that to the global war on terror, the current war that America is engaged in today, since 9-11. So 14 years, 8 months, and 4 weeks we've been fighting and we continue to fight the global war on terror clearly. By the length of the time that we've been fighting in it, this, this is the most important goddamn war we Americans have ever fought in in our lives. At the 1783 Treaty of Paris, we had four major founders, founding fathers, who represented us. Those who represented us at the 1783 Treaty of Paris was Benjamin Franklin, Henry Lawrence, John Jay, and John Adams. So, Let's see, in Hartley. What is this name? guy named Hartley? No, no. David Hartley and Richard Oswald were the ones who had been um, picked for Great Britain. So Great Britain had David Hartley and Richard Oswald represented Great Britain. And we had Benjamin Franklin, Henry Lawrence, and John Jay, and John Adams representing the United States. This is the Paris Peace Talks. They went to Paris, and because of the 1783 Treaty of Paris, that's when the hostilities, the American Revolution, ended. That's when it ceased to carry on. The treaty was signed at the Hotel Hotel de York in Paris on September 3rd, 1783, by Adams, Franklin, Jay, and Hartley. So, if you think about White Eyes and Cornstalk and Maluntha and Salvador Lindy and the president of Honduras in 2009 and Aristide two times in Haiti. If you think it's okay to go around killing and assassinating foreign leaders, if that's acceptable behavior, would you think it would be acceptable if David Hartley and Richard Oswald, the great Britain representatives assassinated Ben Franklin, Henry Lawrence, John Jay, and John Adams during the 1783 Paris Peace Talks. So, evidently, if you're going to have these Paris Peace Talks, if you're going to have any type of peace, you better be careful because that could be the time when you're murdered. That's when Cornstalk was killed during a peace negotiation, during a peace talk. And then Maluta was just killed out of nowhere for no fucking reason, just like White Eyes. White Eyes was killed for absolutely no fucking reason whatsoever. So that's what this is about, the assassination of White Eyes. So, as every red-blooded, true blue, die-hard American know, every die-hard American know the terms of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. If you're an American, of course you know how your country began, and you know how the Revolutionary War ended. Why would you not know that? Are you not a good American? Do you not know how your country began? So the terms of the 1783 Treaty of Paris was that the United States would gain its independence, but we'd be confined to the area east of the Appalachian Mountains. Great Britain would take the area north of the Ohio River, and the area south of the Ohio River would be saved for an independent Indian state, a Native American, a red Native American, a Native Red American state, a Mara Indian, and it would be established under... Spanish control, so it would be an Indian barrier state. Those were the terms of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. Now, as an aside, so let's see, let's, United States is recognized as independent. Then the terms are where we're allowed to exist. The U.S. is confined to the east of the Appalachian Mountains. Great Britain gets the area above the Ohio River. And south of the Ohio River is for an independent Native American state under Spanish control. Now, as an aside, when I was at Spalding University in Karen Dunnigan's class, you had about 20 uh, would-be teachers. There's actually only one other guy that was there. So about 19 young women who were going to be teaching your kids. These are American teachers. And they believe in 100% compliance. That's what to teach like a champion 100% compliance. When I was at Spalding University, 
As a student in Karen Dunnigan's class, I asked these soon-to-be teachers, when did the American Revolution begin? And nobody said a word. Nobody said a word, because nobody knew. Nobody knew when the American Revolution began. And, you know, I think that's an important conversation. I then asked if there were any Americans there, which pissed off one piece of crap in the back. But, anyways, these teachers are going to be fascist dictators telling your kid to shut up and sit down and learn what the hell they think they know, but they don't know jack shit about the American Revolution. So these fascists are oppressing a bunch of your children today. Today, that is happening. So, that's ironic. American teachers don't know shit about the founding of America. And hell, since Kentucky specifically, I'm not sure about the nation, but Kentucky doesn't even teach civics. Civics is not a requirement anymore. So, American government schools do not teach anything about American government. That's ironic. That's how democracy works, right? Isn't that how democracy works? Bruh, duh, bruh, duh. Democracy means shut your mouth and do what the dictator says. It doesn't mean you actually get to speak up and have an opinion and work out your differences and defend your position and to make decisions, collective decisions as a whole, as a group. So, as another aside, most black folks and Native Americans fought against the white Americans. So, if the, you know, if the American Revolution was truly revolutionary, how come most of the black folks and most of the Native Americans fought against the revolutionaries? I question how revolutionary it actually is. The Haitian Revolution, that's a revolution. The French Revolution, that's a revolution. That's a clear cut with the old order and establish something brand new. The American Revolution, the same, many of the same white owning, land owning, slave holders, Indian genocide aristocracy got to maintain their power. Women didn't get a right to vote. Black folks were slaves. Native Americans were being pushed off their land, and even white men. White men, if you didn't own any property, which means the majority of white men didn't even get the right to vote after the, the American Revolution was complete. So is that revolutionary? Is that the oppressed getting power? I don't think it is. That excludes 90% of the continent, of the country. 90% of the country wasn't even recognized during the American Revolution. So, most black folks and Native Americans fought against the white American colonists. This is something that Julie Chancellor had said is not, nah, -uh, that's not true. Yeah, it is totally true. And if you can't even understand chapter one of American history, how am I supposed to trust chapter two, three, four, and on and on and on? So, again, November 5th, 1778 is when White Eyes is assassinated. White Eyes, a.k.a. Koki Thagetston. So, Koki... Koke Thagetston. Koke Thagetston. I am Koke Thagetston. Koke Thagetston. Don't fuck with Koke Thagetston. So, White Eyes is assassinated November 5th, 1778. This is three years after John Murray IV, a.k.a. Lord Dunmore's Emancipation Proclamation, which, you know, almost to the day, his Emancipation Proclamation was issued November 7th, 1775. Three years later, almost to the day, just three years minus two days, White Eyes is going to be assassinated. Now, Lord Dunmore's Emancipation Proclamation, there is an argument that it pissed George Washington off so much, he didn't care about the Boston Tea Party. He wasn't into the revolution until Lord Dunmore issued the Emancipation Proclamation. George might lose his slaves. He was so pissed off, it pressured him into the Revolutionary War. That's why he fought the revolution, to make sure he maintained his slaves. He'll die with 318 slaves. He'll pass the Fugitive Slave Act. And he'll arm the French against the Haitian Rebellion. He'll give them money and guns. 
November 5th, 1778. This is more than two years after the Declaration of Independence and 237 and a half years ago from today. So it's 237 years ago. White Eyes, representing the Lenape, a.k.a. the Delaware, signed the Lenape-Delaware Treaty just a few months ago in that same year, in 1778. The Treaty of Fort Pitt. So let's talk a little bit about who White Eyes is. White Eyes, Native American name, is Coquet Thagetston. Coquet Thagetston. Coquet Thagetston. Coquet Thagetston. So there's power, there's spiritual power in knowing their personal name. They have a public name and then they have a personal name. And his personal name was Coquet Thagetston. To the earth, they're still alive. If you say their name. So Coquet Thagetston. Coquet Thagetston. Coquet Thagetston was a leader of the Lenape Delaware people in the Ohio country during the American Revolution after Chief Netawatwees. So Chief Netawatwees, which means newcomer. So Chief Newcomer, his personal name was Netawatwees. After he stepped down as chief or he died or something, that's when White Eyes becomes the chief of the Lenape Delaware people. Now, White Eyes, he marries Rachel Doddridge. And Rachel Doddridge is a white woman who was kidnapped by the Lenape when she was very young. They had a kid named George Morgan White Eyes, taking his name from his father, White Eyes, and a good friend of White Eyes, George Morgan. Now, George Morgan was a U.S. Indian agent trader and a former close associate of White Eyes. George Morgan negotiated with the Native Americans in the Fort, Fit, Fort Pitt area. So George Morgan is a good buddy of White Eyes. In fact, they were so such good friends, George Morgan and White Eyes had pledged allegiance to one another for as long as the sun shines. And that's why when White Eyes had a son with Rachel Doddridge, he named it after George Morgan. And so his son gets both of those names, George Morgan, White Eyes, or White Eyes, George Morgan, whichever one you want to put first. An interesting thing about Rachel Doddridge, Rachel Doddridge had been living with her father, Philip Doddridge, and family on a farm on the shores of Chartier's Creek near Statler's Fort in present-day Washington County, Pennsylvania. And... Her cousin, Philip Doddridge, reported seeing Rachel Doddridge later as an adult at a trading post. Thoroughly assimilated by then, Rachel Doddridge was not interested in a reunion with her British relatives. So she had been kidnapped by the Lenape when she was young. She got married. She's completely assimilated into the Lenape Delaware culture. And when she sees her cousin, when she sees her family members, she's like, oh, I don't see you. She pretends like she don't even know them. Oh, I don't really know you. Now, I'm not sure what went all the way all up to the top. I bet it's this one, so you just have to memorize this. But White Eyes establishes his own town, his own village, which is known by the colonists as White Eyes Town, near the Lenape capital of Coshocton, Ohio, which is a city and a county in Ohio today. So White Eyes established his own town, which the colonists called White Eyes Town. This is near Coshocton. So that was the thing that went on went on to the top there. <laughs> um, I had to animate each and every one of these bullet points. So anyways, in 1773, Coquet Thagetston, White Eyes, was the speaker of the Lenape Delaware Head Council. In 1774, the that same Lenape Delaware head council called the Grand Council here named Coquet Thagetston the principal chief. The principal chief. I think that's how you spell principal. There's lots of different ways, right? It's not principal. It's the principal, the main one. For some reason I feel like there should be an A in there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He's the principal chief. So he's the chief of the Lenape Delaware in 1774. So 
a quick note for both names, the Lenape, Delaware, and for White Eyes, Co. K. Thogetston, I'm reminded of when Ford bought out New Holland tractors. When Ford bought out New Holland for a minute there, Ford's tractors were called Ford New Holland. So New Holland was blue, they kept the paint, they kept the name on it, so the Ford wanted to know that if you were buying New Holland, you were buying Ford. Eventually, New Holland name, the name New Holland was phased out and it was just Ford. So since the Lenape, which is what the Delaware is supposed to be called, that's their autonym, that's what they called themselves, their enemies called them the Delaware, but since Lenape hasn't come into common English parlance just yet, I'm going to say Lenape Delaware, even though I realize how racist Delaware is, so that eventually, over time, people will know the Delaware as the Lenape people. I'm doing the same thing for Koke Thogetston, and that was his actual name, not White Eyes. The Native American had a public name and a private name, but they kept their private name very private, very close to their hearts because they believed that it had spiritual power. They had spiritual power and they didn't want that spirit, to, they didn't want other people to know about that spirit. If you knew the names of other people's spirits, then that was that was bad, so they tried to keep that private name. So, Ko K. Thogetston is what his friends and family would have called him. Hey, Ko K. Ko K. Thogetston. Hey, Ko K. Thogetston. Koke Thogetston. What's up, Koke Thogetston? Maybe just Koke for short. Hey, Koke. What's up, Koke? But White Eyes is what the colonists had called him. So, and when one person says the person's name to the earth, they're still alive. So, White Eyes had tried, but he was unsuccessful to prevent what would become Lord Dunmore's War in 1774. Lord Dunmore's War was fought primarily between the Shawnees and the Virginia colonists. White Eyes did, however, serve as a peace emissary between the Shawnee and the Virginia colonists and helped to negotiate a treaty to end Lord Dunmore's war. Lord Dunmore, this is the guy that issued the proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, the first Emancipation Proclamation issued in America. Lord Dunmore, some people say that Lord Dunmore's war should be considered the first war of the American Revolution because it had a lot of consequences for what had happened. And it shows the motivations behind what the American colonists, colonists actually wanted. Native American land. They wanted Shawnee land. So soon after the end of Lord Dunmore's war, White Eyes was negotiating a royal grant with Lord Dunmore for his people, he wanted to land for the Delaware, for the Lenape Delaware. So he had negotiated a royal grant with Lord Dunmore to secure the Lenape some territory, some of their own land in the Ohio country, but after the American revolutionaries forced Lord Dunmore out of Virginia, this would be Patrick Henry, White Eyes had to start over his negotiations with the new Continental Congress, the White Americans. You got the Red Americans, Native Americans, and the White Americans. In April 1776, two months prior to the Declaration of Independence being declared, White Eyes addressed the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, with John Hancock presiding as president of the principal governing body of the United States and its military on behalf of the Lenape. So, John Hancock is the president of the United States. I want to say the fourth president. And in April 1776, this would just be right before the Declaration of Independence is declared, K. Thogetston had addressed the Second Continental Congress under John Hancock. Now, September 12, 1778, negotiations for the Treaty of Fort Pitt begin. So, September 12, 1778, you're going to have the Treaty of Fort Pitt, and the Treaty of Fort Pitt is sort of mind-blowing. John Hancock is the fourth president of the United States, and he was the one that was president when the Declaration of Independence was issued. It was written July 2nd, 1776, and then it was celebrated on July 4th, 1776, which we still have uh, fest festivals, festivities, 4th of July fest festivities today, next month, right? We're going to have 4th of July Independence Day. It's when we celebrate our Independence Day. On September 12th, 1778, you have White Eyes along with Captain Pipe 
White Eyes, Co. Keith Augustin, Captain Pipe, Hopacan, and John Kilbuck represented the Lenape. The Lenapes. The Lenape, Delaware. So we're having the Treaty of Fort Pitt. And the Treaty of Fort Pitt is going to be a military alliance. The Continental Congress wanted a military alliance. They wanted to be able to use the lands of the Lenape people so they could attack the British and the Native Americans who had allied with the British. What the Lenape got, not only did they are they in a military alliance, so therefore if they were under attack, they would get the Americans' protection, but they also got a guarantee of a Lenape Delaware state. When Henry Lawrence of South Carolina was serving as the fifth president of the Continental Congress, who succeeded John Hancock. So John Hancock in 1776 was the fourth president of the United States, and now we have Henry Lawrence. Henry Lawrence is the fifth president of the United States, of the Continental Congress. And it was under him that this treaty was negotiated with the Lenape Delaware pe people. Here's a picture of a statue of Captain Pipe. Now, Captain Pipe lived in a 60-person village that was known as... This is actually a, a... The picture was of the statue of him, right? It's not actually him. It was a statue of him. Now, Pipe's Town. Captain Pipe lived at Pipe's Town. It was a 60-person village. And it was about eight miles away from Sandusky, Ohio, near present-day Crawford, the city of Crawford, in Wyandotte County, Ohio. So that's where Pipes Town was, and this is ironic because Crawford is named for William Crawford. And William Crawford was the one who would be tortured and burned to death, and it was... It was Captain Pipe who actually marked William Crawford for death. He painted his face black, and that means you're going to die. So the Lenape would torture William Crawford and then burn him at the stake. And before you say, oh, poor William Crawford, the reason why the Lenape Delaware did this, for one, probably the assassination of White Eyes, but also and the Naden Hutton massacre, but also Edward Hand's Squall campaign, specifically, which is the reason why Simon Gertie deflected, but Edward Hand's Squall campaign ended up killing Captain Pipe's mother, it killed Captain Pipe's brother, and it killed Captain Pipe's children. His mother, brother, and his children was killed by Edward Hand, by the white Americans. The white Americans killed the red Americans, the red Native Americans. So, in exchange for his mother, brother, and children being killed, in exchange for the Naden Hutton massacre, where they, again, the white militia killed the Christian missionaries who were allying with the Americans. So, it didn't matter if the Native Americans were enemies to the white people, to the white colonists, or their enemies, the Americans were killing, killing them both. They were killing white eyes. They were killing the Christian Morovians in Naden Hutton. Naden Hutton. Starts with a G. They killed Maluntha. Cornstalk was trying to negotiate a peace. So anybody that wants to ally with the American colonists, any of the Native Americans who want to ally with the colonists, are getting slaughtered. A quick word about Henry Lawrence. Here's a picture of Henry Lawrence. He's the fifth president of the United States. Now, Henry Lawrence, he is a slave owner, like a major, one of the biggest slave owners ever. So Henry Lawrence is the fifth president of the Continental Congress, and he served more than a year, 404 days, and he served nearly all of 1778. So Henry Lawrence was the president when White Eyes got assassinated, when the Treaty of Fort Pitt was being negotiated. In fact, when uh, McIntosh, Latchland McIntosh, builds a fort in the Ohio country, he's going to name it Fort Lawrence after Henry Lawrence. Now, Henry Lawrence is a slave-owning French Huguenot, and they took off. The French Huguenots did. They want to own their slaves. The, there was something going on in France that they had to take off. 
I want to say maybe the Catholic Protestant argument or debate or war, the war between the Catholics and the Protestants. So Henry Lawrence was a slave-owning French Huguenot who not only was the president of the Second Continental Congress for over a year for nearly all of 1778, but Henry Lawrence would also be one of the three main principal signers of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. And just mentioned this earlier, but the 1783 Treaty of Paris is what would end the American Revolutionary War for Independence. So here's a picture of Henry Lawrence. An interesting story about Henry Lawrence is that he was exchanged for Lord Cornwallis. So after Henry Lawrence served his year as the fifth president of the Continental Congress, he was then appointed the ambassador to the Netherlands. And as his ship was crossing the Atlantic to go to the Netherlands, Henry Lawrence was captured by the English. And the English put him in the Tower of London as a prisoner. And they kept him there until the end of the war. After the Battle of Yorktown, the American government regained his freedom in a dr dramatic prisoner exchange. Henry Lawrence was exchanged for Lord, Lord Cornwallis. And George Washington was instrumental in this exchange. So it gives you a picture of how important this Henry Lawrence was. He signs the 1783 Treaty of Paris. He was the fifth president of the Continental Congress. And they caught, you know, the white Americans had captured Lord Cornwallis, who was the biggest menace, the biggest opponent, the biggest threat to the revolutionary, the white revolution, the George Washington's men. And so in exchange for Lord Cornwallis, they got Henry Lawrence. So here's a picture of Lord Cornwallis. And we're talking about Lord Cornwallis here for a second. It's Lord Cornwallis who lost the so-called final battle of the American Revolution at Yorktown, Virginia, which was won by the white Americans on October 19th, 1781. So according to tradition, the official account, the Battle of Yorktown, it was very significant. After the Battle of Yorktown, the British wanted to negotiate and it was popular in America. We're winning the war in Britain. It becomes, the war becomes less popular. They're losing the war. So I'm not trying to undermine the importance of the Battle of Yorktown. The Battle of Yorktown was very important, but it was not the final battle. It wasn't the final battle. So this, on October 19th, 1781, is when the Battle of Yorktown ends. That's when George Washington and the Continental Army is successful, and they defeat Lord Cornwallis. But it won't be until, what, September or so? Until 1783. 1783 is when the Treaty of Paris is signed, so it won't be another year or two until the end of the war actually happens. The outcome of the Battle of Yorktown actually, an interesting fact, was influenced to some degree by the intelligence provided to the Continental Army by a slave named James Armistead Lafayette. So here's a picture of James Armistead Lafayette. It was his spying work that helped to win victory at the Battle of Yorktown. James Armistead Lafayette owned three slaves. <laughs> but that'll be after he gets his freedom. So he had, before he got his freedom, he worked as a double agent and he worked for the Marquis Lafayette, which was a French general, very young French general that came to America to help the Americans fight the revolution. And of course, France was in favor of the Americans rebelling against Britain because France and England had been enemies for like hundreds of years. So first, James Armistead Lafayette spied on Benedict Arnold after he had deflected to the British side, and then James Armistead Lafayette spied on Lord Cornwallis. He provided critical intelligence with, which helped the French and the Americans achieve victory at the Battle of Yorktown. At first, James Armistead did not win his freedom because they said he was a spy, so therefore he wasn't a, sh a soldier. Only black soldiers won their freedom, but since he was just a spy, and it was you know, Benedict Arnold, Lord Cornwallis, even though he was instrumental in the victory, they said, well, you don't win your freedom. Eventually, he would win his freedom. 
Wikipedia lists 43 more revolutionary battles that happened after the Battle of Yorktown. So, if you want to say the Battle of Yorktown is the final battle, fuck you. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. There's at least 43 more battles that happened after the Battle of Yorktown. And why, don't, why aren't we taught as Americans in the schools these 43 other battles? Well, we're supposed to just worship the victors of the American Revolution. We're supposed to worship George Washington, not caring that he owned all these slaves, was whipping and beating them and stealing pensions from the soldiers that fought in the French and Indian War and ambushing the patrol, the D Jumonville, how he was a liar. We're not supposed to know all the truth about any of these so-called heroes because we're just supposed to worship them. He's a father of the country, he started the nation, he's a great man, just worship him. So that's why we're not told about these 43 other American Revolutionary War battles because these are going to be fought against Native Americans, they're going to be fought in the Caribbean, and there's even one battle that was fought in India. So the American Revolutionary War entailed lots of fighting all over the place. It wasn't just the colonies, but it was against Native Americans like the Battle of Blue Licks, and then in the islands, in the uh, West Indies, and then on the high seas you had all these ships that were fighting against each other. So Lord Cornwallis was also known as Charles Cornwallis, who was also known as the first Marquess Cornwallis. He was also known as Viscount Brome between 1753 and 1762. So for nine years, Charles Cornwallis was called Viscount Brome. And then between 1762 and 1792, Charles Cornwallis styled himself as the Earl Cornwallis. We called him Lord Cornwallis. So after Henry Lawrence was exchanged for Lord Cornwallis, Henry Lawrence then becomes a representative for the United States at the Paris Peace Conference in 1782. And then he would be a signer of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. Alexander Hamilton also one of the founding fathers, absolutely loved John Lawrence. And John Lawrence is the son of Henry Lawrence. So Henry Lawrence had earned great wealth as a partner in the largest slave trading house in North America, named Austin and Lawrence. So the business, Austin and Lawrence, in the 1750s alone, this Charleston firm oversaw the sale of more than 8,000 enslaved Africans. 8,000 enslaved Africans, 8,000, 8,000 Kutikentes was being traded by Henry Lawrence business. He was a partner, Austin and Lawrence. He's the Lawrence in Austin and Lawrence. So the signer of the Treaty of Paris, the fifth president of the Continental Congress, was a major slave trader, just like George Washington owned a bunch of slaves. When he was 10 years old, he got 11 slaves. He kept on getting more and more slaves throughout the years. And he ends up with 318 at his, on his deathbed. His teeth, the, the myth of the wooden teeth, the teeth was actually slave teeth. So we have to cover that up, right? We can't let the people that came after George Washington, that he paid slaves to pull their own teeth so he can make his dentures out of them. We didn't want that to be known. So we created a myth and said he had wooden teeth, which is total bullshit. So Henry Lawrence's son is John Lawrence, and he's a colonel in the Continental Army, and he's an officer on George Washington's staff, John Lawrence is. Alexander Hamilton ple pledged his love for John Lawrence. He absolutely loved him. And I guess he's blue-eyed, you know, uh, good-looking young man. But John Lawrence... You know, that's a, a fact you don't always hear, that Alexander Hamilton loved John Lawrence. And perhaps a plutonic love, maybe not, maybe it was a homosexual love. But John Lawrence believed that Americans could not fight for their own freedom while they were holding slaves. He saw this as a contradiction, an obvious contradiction. And John Lawrence is correct. That's another reason you should not worship these assholes, you know, these slave-holding assholes, your Henry Lawrence, your George Washingtons, you don't know about John Lawrence. The reason why you don't know about John Lawrence is because you're too busy telling me how great George Washington was. 
So if that was just how it was back in the day, so then John Lawrence would be even a bigger badass because he was fighting against slavery when everybody was doing it. But not everybody was doing it. That's just some, you know, that's just what stupid people say. People that don't want to think about any of this. Oh, uh, my, my fourth grade teacher taught me he was the best father of the country in the world. He can't do no wrong. It's on our dollar bill. How could that be wrong? Skeeter? <laughs> Skeeter, this man is trying to tell me George Washington wasn't perfect. Well, why? I mean, that just, is there any person that's perfect out here? So John Lawrence, he, in 1779, persuaded the Continental Congress to authorize the recruitment of a brigade, which is 3,000 men, of African-American slaves. And then they would win their freedom after the war. So he presented this idea to the Continental Congress. The Continental Congress was in favor of it, but when John Lawrence presented it to the South Carolina Provincial Congress, South Carolina overwhelmingly rejected the proposal, and then instead voted to use confiscated slaves as payment to recruit more white soldiers. So now South Carolina says, no, we're not going to put guns in the hands of the black slaves. Instead, the slaves that we captured, we will use them as rewards for white people to fight in the American Revolution. So come, fight the American Revolution and get some slaves out of it. And if you're like James Armistead, Lafayette, you'll eventually get three slaves for yourself. So good fucking job, South Carolina. John Lawrence got Continental Congress on board to raise a brigade of African-American slaves, but South Carolina was like, nah, we're fucking racist pieces of shit. We would rather capture blacks and then give blacks as presents, as gifts, as an incentive for white people to join the war with us. Unfortunately, eventually, John Lawrence is going to be killed at the Battle of Kabahi River which is near Beaufort, South Carolina. He's killed August 27th, 1782. And so he's a martyr. He's a martyr. He's an American Revolution. He fought for this country. He fought for our freedom against the British. He also fought for the freedom of African Americans. So he's, he's a badass. We should know this if we are, you know, to actually, if we think that history means something, and if we have any type of moral morality or conscience we should know this and also look at the date August 27th 1782 this will be a battle that's after the Battle of Yorktown so the, a battle that's after the Battle of Yorktown the Battle of Kabahi River near Beaufort South Carolina so look at that battle who are we fighting why are we fighting these people if Battle of Yorktown was the final battle what the hell is up with the Battle of Kambahi River. So, R.I.P. John Lawrence. He dies at the tender age of 27, only a few weeks before the British finally withdrew from Charleston. And that was when he was shot from his saddle and he was gravely wounded and he eventually died from his wounds at the Battle of the Kambahi River. The Treaty of Fort Pitt was finally completed. After five days of negotiating on September 17th, 1778. So remember, we're still talking about the assassination of White Eyes. So the Treaty of Fort Pitt was finally completed. White Eyes, Coquet Thagetston, John Kilbuck Jr., Guy Lelymond, and Captain Pipe Hopacan were the representatives for the Lenape people. And they all signed it. So the Lenape signed it. They signed the Treaty of Fort Pitt. The Treaty of Fort Pitt was absolutely, or was the historical thing about the Treaty of Fort Pitt between the Lenape Delaware and the Continental Congress was that it was the first treaty between the Continental Congress, between the United States and Native Americans. It's the first treaty between Native Americans and the United States. So that's historical. That's significant. The terms of the 1778 Treaty of Fort Pitt are, you know, fantastic. They're incredible. Okay, so the treaty provided that the Lenape would serve as guides for the Americans when they moved through the Lenape lands in the Ohio country to strike at their British and Indian enemies to the north in and around Detroit. 
So they're military allies. When they go do their fighting, the Lenape are going to help. They can go through the Lenape lands. and But Article 5 is the most remarkable section of the 1778 Treaty of Fort Pitt. In Article 5, it said that a Lenape Delaware state would be created in the Ohio country in exchange for their military alliance. So again, White Eyes negotiated with Lord Dunmore, a state for the Lenape Delaware people. He got it, but then Lord Dunmore is kicked out of Virginia. Then you have the United States, the Continental Congress, White Eyes again. He negotiates some land for his Lenape Delaware people, and he gets it. The Continental Congress signs it, and there's lots of people that signs this uh, document. Lots of white people, lots of white Americans, white revolutionary Americans. So, not only would they would get their state, this would be a Lenape Delaware state, it would be the 14th state of the United States, instead Vermont will be the 14th state, Kentucky will be the 15th state. And not only would they have their own state, their own country, but they would have been established to even have, you know, they would have established their own state, but they would have also had representation in the American Congress. So they would have had a say-so in the government affairs. If they're a state, and they're a state inside the Union, then they would have representation. The white Americans who would sign the document are as follows and there's a whole bunch of them so you have Andrew Lewis and Thomas Lewis were the main signers they were the main ones who had signed the whole thing and this is the white Americans who signed on behalf of the Continental Congress of which Henry Lawrence was the president of so Andrew Lewis and Thomas Lewis, and I don't think they're related, but they were the main two that had signed the agreement, but then so they supposedly had just signed it as witnesses. Now you have Brigadier General, Commander of the Western Department, Latchlin McIntosh, Colonel of the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment, Daniel Broadhead, Colonel William Crawford, John Campbell, John Stevenson, Colonel of the 13th Virginia Regiment, John Gibson. Inside Arthur Graham, Brigade Inspector Latchland McIntosh Jr., First Lieutenant of the 8th North Carolina Regiment Benjamin Mills, Captain of the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment Joseph L. Finley, and Captain of the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment John Finley were all signed. They all signed the Treaty of Fort Pitt. These are all the signers of the Treaty of Fort Pitt. Eventually, the Treaty of Fort Pitt is going to be reneged on, it's going to be a lie. And so it's the first treaty between the United States and the Native Americans, and it's going to be the first broken promise between the young nation, between the white Americans and the red Americans. It's going to be the first broken promise. Now, after the Treaty of Fort Pitt was signed, White Eyes gives a speech, and White Eyes says this. He gives a speech to the representatives of the United States, to all those signers. This is at Fort Pitt. So White Eyes, this is White Eyes' voice, Koke Thogetston. Koke Thogetston says, Brothers, you desired us in the speech you made to us yesterday that if we could think of anything for the advantage of both of us that we should mention it. We now request that the wise brethren in Congress may be informed that it is our particular request that Colonel John Gibson, they really like John Gibson, Colonel John Gibson may be appointed to have charge of all matters between you and us. We esteem him as one of ourselves. He has always acted as an honest part by us, and we are convinced he will make our common good his chief study and not think only how he may get rich. He's not just out for the money. He's not just out for his own glory. He actually wants to be fair. So, John Gibson, good job, John Gibson. You had actually won the Lenape's trust, so in a way, I trust John Gibson out of all those other signers, um, you know, more than anybody else. Okay, so we esteem him as one of ourselves. He's always acted an honest part. He's not going to just try to get rich. We desire also that John Gibson may have charge of and take care of the warriors of our people who may join you in the present expedition. When we were last in Philadelphia, our wise brethren in Congress may remember we desired them to send schoolmasters to our towns to instruct our children, as we think it would be for our mutual interest. We request it may be complied with. 
So white eyes, he wants schools, he wants instructors, he wants to be educated like the white men. I even read in the historical marker that he was Christian. He wanted to be anglicized. He wanted to be a Christian, American, speak English, and assimilate into the culture. So he wants a school. He wants John Gibson to be the one that is the intermediator between the Continental Congress and the Lenape Delaware. And when they go on the expedition against the British, they wanted John Gibson to be leading. That's what White Eyes had requested. So the next day, that was his speech. And then the next day, presents were given to the Lenape Delaware on behalf of the United States, and the Native Americans rode back to Coshocton, the Lenape capital, to make preparations for joining the expedition against Detroit. So overall, here are the accomplishments of White Eyes. Koke Thagetchton. Some say it could be his legacy. He negotiated a Lenape state. He negotiated one with Lord Dunmore. He got kicked out. Then he negotiated another one with the Continental Congress in 1778 at the Treaty of Fort Pitt. He was a peace emissary in Lord Dunmore's war. He helped the Shawnee and the Virginia colonists declare peace. And so there was peace between the Native Americans and the Virginian colonist. He was a trader, so he traded goods. He was a businessman. He was a tavern keeper, so again, a businessman. He had his own establishment, and he founded White Eyes Town near present-day Coshocton. So he did all, you know, so far this is what he's accomplished. Negotiated Lenape State, founder of White Eyes Town, peace emissary, and Lord Dunmore's 1774 tavern owner and trader. This is all before he was brutally, unnecessarily assassinated by Lachlan McIntosh or his men. Lachlan McIntosh's men. Why would we kill White Eyes? White Eyes is letting us use the land. White Eyes is our ally. He's an interpreter. He's fighting on our expedition. Why murder him? Why kill him? So Koke Thogetston is now going to get killed. In early... November 1778, White Eyes joined General Latchland McIntosh's expedition into the Ohio country as a guide and negotiator and as a warrior. Latchland McIntosh would be Edward Hand of the Squaw Campaign. Edward Hand was the one who had killed Captain Pipe's brother, mother, and children. He has to step down after the Squaw Campaign. Latchland McIntosh takes over, and he's the big general of the western country. So... Latchland McIntosh uh, replaces Edward Hand. Then you have Lachlan McIntosh had also killed a, an original signer of the Declaration of Independence. He killed Button Gwinnett. Button Gwinnett was fatally killed by Latchland McIntosh in a 1777 duel. The state of Georgia has named the McIntosh County after his family, in honor of his family. Georgia also has a county named for Button Gwinnett. The man Latchland McIntosh killed in a duel. So both of these were great men. Latchland McIntosh was a great man. Button Gwinnett was a great man. But Latchland McIntosh kills an original signer of the Declaration of Independence. Latchland McIntosh wanted to build Fort Lawrence, named after Henry Lawrence, the fifth president of the United States, in the Ohio country at Tuscarawas. Now, I want to say that's spelled correctly. I think they misspelled it in the document that I read, but I think it's where Tuscarora County is today. So they wanted to build Fort Lawrence at Tuscarora so it would be easier to attack the British in Detroit, also to protect the uh, settlers and to protect the um, Native Americans who allied with them, but also to attack the Native Americans who were friendly to the British in Ohio. But Latchland McIntosh hated having to ask permission. He absolutely hated having to ask the Lenape Delaware permission every time he wanted to cross their lands. He just hated them. He hated White Eyes. It probably Some people say that the Treaty of Fort Pitt might have been just one big-ass ruse, one big lie. Just to get them to sign, to give them the permission, to guide them through the forest, to use their warriors. So... Right before Latchland McIntosh set out to march through
through the Ohio country to kill the Native Americans at Sandusky, who are believed to have allied with the British on November 5, 1778, Lackland McIntosh, or his men, assassinated White Eyes. Koke Thagetson. His voice is heard no more. Koke Thagetson, a loyal American ally. He was either killed at Tuscarawas, though one account said that he was killed in Pittsburgh at Fort Pitt itself. Lackland McIntosh then would cover up his or his men's crimes or assassination, the crime of assassination, by lying and saying that White Eyes had died of smallpox when it was he was with Latchlin and his men. So, oh, we didn't kill him. We didn't take a tomahawk and split his head open. He died of smallpox. If you're his family, you definitely knew what was up. Okay, he goes out on this expedition. He has to be with John Gibson. Instead, he's with Lachlan McIntosh, and then he's never seen or heard from ever again. When you do hear about it, they make up a lie. He died of the smallpox on the way up there. Oh, really? How fucking convenient. After McIntosh claimed that White Eyes had caught the smallpox, Captain Pipe, who was very distrustful of the white Americans, gloats. And he says that the Great Spirit had actually killed him because he was preventing the Lenape Delaware people from actualizing their their fullness, their full humanity. So there was a big White Eyes kept saying, no, the white Americans are good. No, ally with them. No, trust them. No, sign this treaty. No, they'll be good to us. They'll be good on their word. Captain Pipe said, no, they won't. They've been fighting us against the whole time. Fighting. Captain Pipe was there at uh, Henry Bouquet in the French and Indian War. Captain Pipe's been around for a long time. He's like, no, I've seen this shit. I've seen it a million times. They're a bunch of liars, and they're going to end up killing you. And then they did. And then he was like, see, I told you so. The Cherokee, when they heard that White Eyes, Koke Thurgetston had died, they sent 14 Cherokee to give condolences to the Lenape. George Morgan, White Eyes, white friend, who had vowed to be friends with White Eyes, Koke Thurgetston, until the sun stopped shining, until the sun stopped burning, who was the namesake of White Eyes' only child, George Morgan White Eyes, denounced Latchlin McIntosh for the assassination of White Eyes to Congress by letter. George Morgan wrote that White Eyes had been treacherously put to death at the moment of his greatest exertions to serve the United States. So White Eyes was fighting for the United States, and that's when he was cut down. The Americans reported White Eyes had contracted smallpox and died during the expedition, but that was a lie. After White Eyes' death, the Red Lenape Native American alliance with the White Americans was completely severed. The genociders had no interest in supporting a state under Lenape control nor helping the Delaware people out. Captain knew what was up the whole time, and he claimed that the Great Spirit had killed the Native Red American White Eyes because of his cozy relationship with the genociding white Americans. On April 19, 1781, Daniel Broadhead, a signer of the 1778 Lenape Delaware Treaty of Fort Pitt, Daniel Broadhead, a so-called American revolutionary, would invade Coshocton. This is the capital of the Lenape Delaware people. He invaded Coshocton with 300 men. Daniel Broadhead found about 40 Lenape Delaware people still living there, and they were all captured without firing a single shot. Daniel Broadhead's men then took the Lenape men, and there was 15 of the 40. They took 15 of the Lenape men out of the sight of the scared squaws and children, and they killed them by tomahawk, chopping their heads in two, and then, or killing them with tomahawk and then scalping them, or scalping them, or killing them with tomahawk, or whatever. They scalped them, they killed them with tomahawk, probably shot them too, right? 15 of them, they killed them out of 40. And they, all, they took them without firing a shot. So they killed prisoners. And there was only 40 Lenape that were still, was still at Coshocton, even though it was the capital of the Lenape at one time. The next day, a Lenape native came upon Coshocton, wanted to go back to his people in peace, but he hadn't known about Daniel Broadhead's massacre. And the white American militia called him on over, feigning peace. But as soon as the red Lenape Native American man came close enough, Lewis Wetzel sunk his tomahawk 
through the Lenape native skull killing him. So I find it ironic that when you think of scalping and tomahawking you think of Native Americans but it's the white colonists who's tomahawking and scalping the Lenape at Coshocton and Le Lewis Wetzel is tomahawking the Lenape native who came upon Coshocton after the massacre at Coshocton by Daniel Broadhead's men. Ten years later, Rachel Doddridge, White Eyes' wife, the English wife, was murdered by white men in 1788. Their mixed race son, George Morgan White Eyes, was cared for by the family friend George Morgan, which really is the least that George Morgan could do since he promised to his friend that he would be friends with White Eyes until the sun stopped shining. He wasn't able to protect Kokei Thargetston. He wasn't able to stop Kokei Thargetston's assassination. Later, George Morgan White Eyes, the son, was educated at the College of New Jersey, which was later called Princeton University, and he graduated in 1789. So White Eyes' legacy still lives on through his son. White Eyes' legacy his namesake also lives on in White Eyes Township in Coshocton County, Ohio. So, Kokei Thaugetston. Kokei Thaugetston forever.